Pal. Hey there, welcome to Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. I'm Pete Townsend from Noe Adventures, your co-host of Money Never Sleeps, along with Owen Fitzgerald. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialist, Top Tier Recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it's highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. In this episode, the comeback kid, Owen Fitzgerald, helps me dig into a few of the things that happened in the past week in tech, venture deals, and the topics we generally cover in our day jobs. So let's just get right to it with this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Money Never Sleeps, pal. Here we go again. Welcome to Money Never Sleep, recording today from the home studio. This week, we're looking at three developments or pieces of content that are relevant to all of you, our faithful audience. We've got Owen Fitzgerald back for the first time since episode 64 with Eddie Dillon from Credit Logic. Uh, it's great to be back. Yeah, yeah, it's good to have you back, buddy. I didn't realize it was that long ago. Jesus, yeah. you're, churning, you're churning them out every week for a play to piece. Yeah. Keeping it going. Hey, my pleasure. Episode 64, I, buddy. No, I'm, I'm back for good now. Good man. Good that, man. That, take that song is in the background. They're playing back for good. No, I'm back. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, 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 won't, uh, we won't share with the listeners any photos of your, your COVID 19 cut. But uh, I'm sure that you'd fit right Bad in. Bad die job. You know I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so good luck with that. Good luck with yeah, that. Yeah. All right. So what we're going to do this week, folks, is that we're going to look at three stories uh, that are meaningful to us, that are meaningful to what we're doing in our day job, um, and that we think would resonate with all of you guys. So why don't we just dig right in? Um, the first right. one that we're going to look at is the news from the UK government on Monday in the Financial Times that they're launching a 1.25 billion pound plan to help struggling UK startups. So I thought it was funny. Well, not funny, advantageous, helpful, whatever you want to call it, Owen, that UK have finally woken up to the benefits of match funding for startups through convertible <laughs> notes with a 20% discount it's, on the valuation. It's strangely the familiar, round. Pete. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a, before. <laughs> a sovereign investment agency of a neighboring country to the UK that's been doing this yeah. for years, and you might be familiar with them, Owen. Yeah, strange one. I haven't, I haven't come across this. Uh, yeah, but look, I'm, I mean, it made a lot of noise, obviously, and raised a lot of questions, which I'm sure we're going to cover off. Um, first of all, look, I mean, the, obviously, the UK responded to it needed to be done but i suppose like i said it raises some real questions because you run the risk potentially of trying to fund everybody and is it seen as a bailout for everybody it's a really tough time for startups you're probably hearing it as much as i am they're on a journey but they're not yet you know even fully baked or anything some of them so the question is uh, from a priority point of view if you're going to be funding supporting people you know where does the money go first and then how do you deal with trying to support startups? So it, it's how, how high or how low does the, the investment committee making these decisions set the bar? And I think in the article, Ophelia Brown, founder of Lawson Capital, said that she praised the intent of it. Great, let's support startups. But um, it shouldn't be used as a prop to support the less successful companies and investors because long term, that will do just as much damage to the UK's strong tech ecosystem. Uh, you're going to have proponents of this and opponents of this, but you can't just immediately put in place this sovereign backed enterprise agency approach to making investment committee decisions, right? It's different and it's different than VC. And, you know, and, and it's a really hard one to balance because it, you know, it depends on what the mandate here is. Is it keeping these companies going? Is it keeping jobs in place? You know, do you, if a company has two employees versus one that maybe has five employees, like which is more important to fund, even if one is maybe in a more promising position than the other, like who's making the decisions here in terms of which company to support? And that's going to be the challenge because everyone is feeling the pain, but let's say a company in the tra doing something in the travel tech space, like they could be 18 months from, you know, being able to actually sell again or have their business um, going in the direction it was going in but if they're a good team and there's a good product you know do you wait that out but they probably need a longer runway in terms of support than someone selling into a different sector you nobody is a nobody can predict the future in some of those sectors so what do you do in those scenarios and then yeah. it's a you know 
it, it's a case of like it'll be interesting to see what the like you said where is the bar being set on what types of companies because it's can, it can't be seen as a bailout because you run the risk then of bailing out the companies that were you know two or three years into it and going nowhere before this happened and are just being kept alive then yep exactly the the match funding element of this as well given that it's new in the uk and there are so many more vcs at the seed stage um, and early stage overall in the uk than there are in ireland there's just a you know a certain protocol for how vcs and an enterprise agency like this a sovereign agency like this co-invest right and getting those types of things in place um, they got to move pretty quickly on that. So hopefully they can distribute this uh, this capital quickly enough. But I think it's probably not going to be done with uh, a degree of consistency that you would find in normal times. But these are far from normal times, right? No. And, and I think on, like the match funding, I suppose, is a key bit to it, because the reality is then you're not just you're not just as the UK government making the decision. Maybe it becomes less of a less being less seen as a bailout thing then because they're at least saying, well, look, someone else needs to put money in. So we're we're being guided by the VC or the angel or whatever it is. So we're not just saying here's money for everyone and there's uh, support for everyone in the audience. But we're saying that actually, you know, if the VC is willing to put money in again, obviously they believe in this opportunity and the companies that can't get that much funding well obviously they're you know they're less likely to survive you could argue so the government then shouldn't be putting money into them absolutely i mean if you were you know if you were there owen working for the uk government what would you tell them how would you how would you say to them listen these are some of the important things that you guys got to get you, you got to put in place to make this work. Oh, okay. Way to put me on the spot there. Um, yeah. What, what, <laughs> what no, I mean, I just, s- just, just, just off the top of your head with your experience with this type of stuff, right? Yeah. Well, like, I mean, there's a couple of things because obviously there's a, there's a, a speed element to this, which is going to be a challenge. So given that this is not their kind of bread and butter and it's not something they've done before, you know, they need to be fairly, I'd say fairly light to a degree on the instrument they're going in. Yeah, you know, to, you know have it, it needs to be fairly boilerplate, I'd imagine. And they're just like typically in the situations like this, you're going with the terms of, of some other investor, but they need to be able to churn these things out quickly. So maybe there are particular types of companies, particular sectors that are of more, more obvious importance, or maybe they're they feel more strongly about. I'd probably be, be leaning on some of the bigger funds as well to kind of get their view on it. You know, some of the big name VCs that are out there where they might have relationships already. I mean, uh, the chancellor is what he's a former hedge fund investor, so he probably knows a lot of these guys around town already. Yeah. So you probably want just some input because, again, like I said, it's the speed here and the ability to to do it, and obviously get people signed up to the fact that there's going to be a discount on it as well. So you know, you need a lot of buy-in from the market as well. I mean, I would hope that they would have started those conversations before announcing it, a little bit of a head start, and, and hope that they haven't kind of blindsided the industry over there. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, they, you know, the Chancellor, was it Rishi Sunak, if he is a former hedge fund investor, he will have had relationships with VC firms, probably not materially, but definitely um, at least within his network. So I think um, they're going would, to, yeah, you know. You would think he's coming at it from the right kind of mindset. You know, he would know probably the right, he would hope that he would know the kind of right things to be guiding his team to be kind of putting in place ahead of this, that, that this isn't just, oh, well, we've announced this fund, you know, so you know, it's not, it's not for everyone. Um, it's for successful companies. So, okay, so let's talk to some of the big, the biggest VCs in town and say, well, what are the sectors? What sectors are being hit the biggest on their side? Where are they looking to prop up companies? You know, that sort of thing and get, get some input from them give them that guidance because they're not necessarily this isn't necessarily something they've done before in the same way so they should be leaning on that support where they have it yeah absolutely no i was going to say like the, ter- the terms of it so you know okay so let's say they're giving in 250 grand or whatever uh matched alongside it like what's what's the terms on that you know it needs to be light touch and it's obviously probably going in convertible loan notes or whatever but like, what's the what's the maturity on those? What's the re- repayment on that? What's expected of the companies? Because obviously, you don't want to be then burdening, overburdening the companies at the same time. That the UK government wants to get the money paid back at some point. So, what are the that that's you know that's another key piece for them to try to figure out themselves. So, it's going to be interesting. What I what I think we could do is probably reach out to some of our friends in the UK and see who is 
actually applying for this and see what the process looks like. And we could probably report back later on, which would be pretty cool. I know the guy, um, one of the guys mentioned in the article, Toby Koppel, uh, he's a partner at Mosaic Ventures. I've traded emails with him a couple of times on, uh, on deals. And he said, it shouldn't be a handout to every software company in the UK. And, you know, like we've been saying for the last five minutes, totally agree with all that. Um, but it is something, it is positive. Um, it is supportive, right? So uh, hopefully they can they can get it to work, yeah? Yeah, and it's just, look, it's harder to judge than, uh, you know, an established company because you're talking about, uh, oh, what's the criteria? Is it a, you know, 10% plus drop in revenue? Well, a lot of, what if these companies don't have revenue? Is it projected revenue? Like, that's a bit harder to, to rule out companies and they can say, oh, well, you know, my projections for this year were 2 million and now they're only going to be 200 grand. But, like, it's projections for a startup, so... You know, there's a finger in the air element to that at the best of times anyway. They want to do it right and they want to do it quickly. So there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of pieces to be put together on it. So best to yeah. look to them. A lot, of, lot of stuff to build, right? And on that oh, yeah. note, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. on that note, let's take a look at uh, Mark Andreessen's It's Time to Build essay. So Mark Andreessen is one of the founding partners of Andreessen Horowitz that we know affectionately as A16Z. Um, and this was on their website on, over the weekend on the 18th of April. And alongside Mark Andreessen is our muse, Ben Horowitz. They invest in seed to late stage tech companies. They're now over $10 billion in assets under management across multiple funds. These are some of the smartest people in venture, right? You listen to some of their podcasts, whether it's you know the A16Z podcast or some of their other channels, you feel hyper educated, like uh, Neo getting a little widget stuck in the back of his head, and all of a sudden he's like, "I know jujitsu, right?" So what what Mark did is he put out this blog post that basically said, "No institution of the Western world was prepared for coronavirus. What are we going to do about it?" it he, he basically said, "There is a widespread inability to build, and the problem runs deeper than your favorite political opponent or your home nation." So let's take that off the table right away. This isn't a politically themed post, whether it's for the left or for the right, um, mainly focused on the United States, obviously, because that's where Mark lives and that's the economy that he's part of and that he's supportive of with the venture investments they do. But I was encouraged by it. I was a bit fired up about it. Um, there have been there's been quite a lot of new you know noise around this on social media. Some people have come back with their own posts pointing to stuff from 20 years ago that people said the same way. Others have said, "Oh my God, he's right. We got to do something about this." What do you think? Well, well, first thing, th- this feels like you know th- this is his uh, a repeat of his what was that seminal moment? Uh, Software is eating the world or whatever from I don't know 10 or more years ago. So th- yeah, th- this this feels like for me now that I'm in in this kind of environment this is like oh no, wow this is that moment for me you know um so it was crazy to see like it was great to see obviously because he, he doesn't speak or even blog post as much as he used to so it kind of feels like when he does that it's you know it's of real value and people should be sitting up and taking notice um look i think he's dead right like clearly they've gotten to where they've gotten to because they're very very not only intelligent guys but well kind of connected and and recent horowitz are invested across multiple sectors around across the globe so they have a good handle on what's going on but he is right like the reality is a lot of these issues and even you see like take basic solutions that are being rolled out across uh, globally or whatever and they have companies able to spin up things a lot quicker to support uh, some of the issues that are going on like you saw i don't know if you saw tesla rolled or were able to build like in the course of days thousands of ventilators and ship yeah. them across the US you know so there's a different kind of mindset and like I know we can say it's not political I know what he means he, it's not a politically driven post but like he is talking about the the issues some of the some of the things that he's raising in it are like pointing at government and agencies and things like that not being equipped to build or not having that mindset to be able to build and evolve and I suppose innovate in the same way because like if you look at this particular issue he's talking about this particular issue and the response is being driven by governments across the world so the onus or the focus here the responsibility is on those governments to solve these problems so, and is it, it is yeah. it is but I one of the other posts I saw related to this Owen said something to the effect of when you have small countries uh, like Ireland, right? Take, for example, 5 million people. There, You have enough small groups that can wage influence, and the smaller groups generally tend to have more consolidated opinions, right? And that they can, you know, they can, they can get things done. Um, when you're looking at a 
country of 300 million people, you have enough people who just don't care, right? And where politicians are pursuing other issues that will keep them elected. Um, as our friend Bradley Tusk said to us about 50 episodes ago, right? They just want to get reelected. They're going to do whatever they can to get the votes to get reelected, right? And never mind right from wrong. It's just how will I get back in office? How will I stay in office? And this isn't a a, a slight on the United States of America where I was born and raised in a country that I love. But, you know, at the same time, it is what it is. But it, when you have that many people that in that many mouths to feed and that many political agendas to support, getting mobilizing action around the things that Mark is talking about, housing, education, manufacturing, transportation, where he says the problem isn't money. We have more than enough. It's desire. There's just not enough collective desire to make a difference out there. Now, we talk about education and both of my sisters being professors, you know, they could talk for hours about how to do this and what to do. It's just when it gets to the political level, it gets watered down. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it, what will be really interesting is actually is that change is being forced on all of those industries. And it'll be interesting to see, like, can they cope? Like, education is a is a, an obvious one. Like, what happens in? I had, a, I had a, listened to a really good podcast. I'm a big fan of Professor Galloway, so I was listening to. He has a new one out, Prof G. That's his new podcast, and I was listening to it the other day. And obviously, he's aside from being an entrepreneur and everything else, he's also um, a business lecturer for uh, the Stern Business School at NYU. And he was talking about his view on the future of education. You know, he's saying like nobody's going to pay for uh, well Harvard and the likes. He maybe does a top ten universities internationally that'll keep you know the higher fees. But after that, people are going to be want to be saying, well, why am I paying high fees if I'm going to be doing online courses? You know, what's the value add that I'm getting? And it's the ability of some of those institutions then to evolve and be able to offer something different. But again, it comes back to that. You know, are some of them too big and too bloated with bureaucracy and stuff to be able to actually make some of those changes? And, it apply, and like, look, I know Mark, is, he's writing about the US, and that's a bigger issue when you compare it to the likes of Ireland. At least we're smaller. We've clearly shown in the last couple of months that we have that ability to kind of, you know, band together and work together. And everyone's kind of rallied behind each other to come up with solutions and to try solve this. And then obviously the way the US is structured, um, it's so divided in terms of who has the control and the ownership, who's responsible for certain things. And it just makes it very difficult for them to take that kind of uh, joined up action. You know, and, and which is why then you see so much of the innovation coming out of there from coming out from the private sector. You know, when you look at you look at Silicon Valley and you look at the Teslas and you look at all these guys and the amount of innovation that comes out of the US, but it's all coming out of you know, the private sector. And oh, I, I thought it was funny that you had a, a Trump came out with his team of guys who were going to help reopen the economy or whatever it was, and they were all like the, the Mark Cuban was on it and Zuckerberg and all these others. And you're like, that's great, but like. And that is great. But on one hand, this is probably not the thing, you know, the timing to reopen the economy is probably not the thing you want those guys on a panel for. No, no, absolutely no. not. I, I want Mark Cuban back on broadcast.com in 1998 when he ditched yeah. that and sold it off to Yahoo for a billion or whatever it was because it was way too early for uh, for broadband, right? Way too yeah. early for, you know, for digital TV because the, the broadband wasn't there. That's a Mark Cuban I like, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but it just go, it, it just points to it like the, the 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 innovation or what's the input that's needed is needs to come from outside of government because effectively I could you know in this in this particular scenario he's talking about government and the lack of I suppose being able to innovate and build things that's is is my take on it anyway in terms of what he was what he was saying and what he was getting at. Yeah, I I also picked up a a very subtle hint towards uh, central bank digital currencies, right? Um, which was there <laughs> with with A16Z's crypto fund and the fact yeah, that yeah. they re you know repapered their business really so that they're all regulated investment advisors um, so that they can invest as much as they like in illiquid assets. What he said, he said, a government that collects money from all its citizens and businesses each year has never built a system to distribute money to us when it's needed most. And I think in the bill that was pushed through for supporting small businesses, um, there was in the, that bill at some stage, or maybe it was the bigger bailout bill in the U.S., a provision for the creation of some type of digital currency. Right. It got pulled out. Right. Nothing ever happened with it. Uh, this was like a month ago. But, you know, what, what he's saying is that 
Uh, employers are taking money out of people's paychecks every week and sending that to the IRS, right? But there's no way to redistribute that money quickly back to folks when they need it most. So that's either saying, hey, let's do a central bank digital currency where we can um, pop $1,200 into everybody's digital wallet, or let's have someone come in with some innovative fintech app that then you know just roots it to people's PayPal accounts, right? Or creates PayPal accounts for them on the fly, right? Something like that. There's an opportunity there. You know, it is. It, it was a very uh, big point to me that really stood out. That says yes, the government could take, but it's really hard for the government to give, right? So, and again, like you know, it comes. He talks about desire. Um, it's probably unfair to uh, to use that word because you know you could argue then that that means that there's no motivation for the people in those positions to actually change or innovate. I mean, there is, but there probably is to a certain level. But I think some of it is that you need that outside, those outside viewpoints, and you need that outside expertise sometimes because when you're in government or some of these institutions and you're there long enough, like you know, you lack that kind of outside viewpoint and the ability to see well what actually can be done here. You know, which is why, like I said, it was good to see on one hand Trump getting, you know, some of the heads of industry involved, but just put them involved in the wrong things. I know. Uh, one, one of the other things that stood out to me was when he said the things we build in huge quantities like computers and TVs, they drop rapidly in price. The things we don't build like housing, schools and hospitals skyrocket in price. And I, we, I think we've all seen that graph about, you know, the consumer price index and how these big ticket items have dropped technology driven have dropped over the last 20 years, but uh, the public services um, and the general privatized services around housing, schools and hospitals just continue to go up. That's an imbalance that I think not is not just an American problem. It's a global problem. Oh, absolutely. Right? And I, but I do think that in some of these industries and in, in a lot of ways now, like this change has been forced on people and even like something as simple as remote working. Like there's a lot of agencies, government agencies internationally in Ireland, whatever, who've been forced to figure out how to do their business remotely. And like the genie's out of the bottle now. How do you, how do you go back to the norm? Well, you don't. So you've started to innovate and you've started your transformation journey, whether you want to or not. So you just got to keep going on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, no matter no matter what type of uh, economic situation you're in, which brings us nicely to the final one that we're going to look at today, folks, which is NFX's 28 moves in a downturn. NFX are a venture capital firm, Seed Stage, based in San Francisco. This was a blog post last month by Pete Flint, a managing partner at NFX. Um, they produce some great content. I'm on their mailing list. I get something from them at least once a month that is really helpful. I actually, one of the things I saw from Pete Flint was kind of a, um, you know, uh, 15 or 20 different vignettes on video, one to two minutes long each on pitching to VCs. I was so enthused by it that I broke my golden rule of saying, never cold email a VC, right? And his email address was at the bottom of the blog post. So I said, I'll just send him an email. I wanted his opinion on something. I forget what it was. It was so uh, you know, not meaningless, but irrele irrelevant and meaningless. He didn't get back to me, right? And I said in the email, I said, Pete, I'm breaking my golden rule of sending an email to a VC. Get a warm intro first and apologies for not doing that. But here's my question. Never heard from him. Um, so anyway, we'll, we're giving him a nice shout out either way. And, and maybe we'll hear, hear back from him uh, at some stage. But we've shouted out to Ben Horowitz plenty of times and we, we haven't heard back yeah, from him. Yeah. He's not, a that man, not that Pete and Ben are, are in the same class, but you know, yeah, he, yeah. he won't hold out against us. Anyway, what, what Pete said in his, his blog post, 28 moves. We're just going to cover four of them. He said, uh, focus on managing losses, gaining ground, and managing psychology. And the blog post was split into those three different categories. And we'll put that into the show notes so that everyone can read it. Um, but managing losses, which is kind of just you know, stem the tide first, right? Just uh, get those band-aids on, do what you have to. Second one was gaining ground, was how do you actually take this, take advantage of the opportunity that we're in right now to get ahead? I mean, I've been saying to folks that at the best of times, when you're a pre-seed or a seed state startup, it is all about survival, right? So the first section of this blog post around managing losses, around keeping your head above water, that is what most early stage startups are doing anyway, right? So, um, but just picking out the four 
that are that were meaningful and I'm just going to take two and 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 talk about them but the first one being change your plan to prioritize cash don't run out of money it's easier said than done but think about what you can do so for example we've got friends at data chemist um, so Kevin Feeney, who was on the show way back in the episode somewhere in the 20s, um, I caught up with his brother, Luke Feeney, his chief commercial officer, um, about a month ago. And he said that they are very dependent uh, and had been very dependent on enterprise sales. Enterprise sales being something where you need somebody, your, your champion within the enterprise, to put their neck on the line for you. And for them to do that, they need to like you just enough in order to put their neck on the line. Right? That's hard to do when you can't do face-to-face or physical meetings and build that relationship. No matter what Zoom does, it's still hard to do right? and be able to build that human connection with somebody, get that relationship going so that they will take a political internal corporate risk on your behalf. Luke realized that, Kevin realized that, and said, we have this other brand, Terminus DB, that we are selling direct to developers online where we don't need that personal relationship. Let's, within two weeks, which they did back in March, um, move a heck of a lot of our resources into pushing that. Um, and that's them kind of, you know, saying, listen, let's focus on the Terminus DB brand for now, right? And saying, how do we change our plan quickly? Uh, when you're a startup, you can do that, right? You don't have a thousand employees that you need to repurpose. You've got maybe 10. And, you know, I, I was really impressed to hear them, uh, to hear them do that. Think about professional services, setup fees. Um, can you tack on an extra thousand or something per year for a license fee uh, for helping your customers get set up to use your product, obviously virtually rather than in person? Um, so the, that was number one. I also thought one that was really resonated with me was speed is your asset, right? Drop the superfluous stuff and move fast to gain ground on your competitors and incumbents who will be doubly slow. Right. Uh, I'd say in the past, geez, probably six or nine months, um, 2019 was a was a tough year for me. And I hit a point in August of last year where I made some decisions to change tact. Um, And there was a bunch of things that were kind of just operating out on the perimeter. Um, And I said, you know what, I'm just going to let those things drop um, and see what happens and see if they start screaming on the floor and rolling around and crying for me to pick them up. And they didn't, so I let them go, right? And that made a huge change in my approach and a huge change in how I was doing things. Um, those so superfluous things that you just don't need uh, in your day-to-day, you drop those things, you can move quicker uh, and you can get ahead and focus more on building those relationships, right? Um, so, you know, th- those were the two that that really stood out to me. What were the ones that, that you liked, Owen? Yeah, so the two that jumped out to me was uh, keep playing to win, not just to survive. And I'm seeing a lot of that already with some of the startups I'm working with. Like, obviously, it's a bad time. Everyone's focusing on, you know, stemming the pain. But there are plenty of opportunities, depending on what you're talking about. So, like, your your data chemist example was really good there. I have, an, I have another one client who I was talking to today. And they were, you know, they've just repositioned one of their pieces of what they were doing Um and they've kind of pushed out. They had an acquisition lined up. They were raising cash uh, as part of their seed round. They were going to close an acquisition. They've just gone back to those guys and said, "Look, this is not this is the piece we were focusing on, but actually, the other smaller, steady revenue bit is the one that's kind of started to move along quicker." So they've pushed back the acquisition. You know, and just decided strategically that actually, in the current environment, they're better off working on this one because it's starting to steadily creep up now on the revenue side. So. You know, it wasn't part of the major plan, but it is now, and they're taking advantage of that opportunity. It hasn't just been a focusing on surviving, you know, and that's great. And I've heard, seen, I've heard a few stories like that. And some of these things have just kind of come out of left field with some of the companies. They're asking for more of this offering, or maybe it was an earlier version of a product that actually is a bit more beneficial now in the current environment. I had a, I had a, a conversation around that with a client uh, last week, whereby it was kind of version one of their product which they hadn't really been pushing out there and they'd had a lot of take up on that and they had to move shift some resources to actually allow them to, there was a lot of people downloading the kind of uh, that product and they had to push some resources towards it to meet up with that to make up that demand but actually now they can get a lot of traction out of that because it fits nicely into the current environment so you know that is a key bit there's lots of opportunities there 
and uh, people should just be ready to move on them and it ties into your speed but then as well in terms of being actually able to move quickly on some of this stuff because obviously the incumbents won't be able to and then the other piece that the one that kind of stuck out was around focus and you know talking about killing vanity metrics and pet projects and i had that i had that very conversation with that client i was talking about today where they're looking to push back an acquisition and the funny thing is that the acquisition they were they were looking to do was going to really bring on the payments offering that they were going to be offering as part of their wider solution and it was actually the 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 head of payments guy on the team who was one of who was the main guy saying look we should push this back you know, and that was great. And the, the team were surprised, but obviously pleasantly surprised to see that because it recognizes where they're going and where the opportunity is right now and that that other piece can be done at a later point in time. But they didn't have to fight this guy on it. He was he was the one leading that kind of conversation. At the moment, you can't do everything. And all of those nice, interesting, small projects that people are putting resources into, you know, they're just going to have to be let slip because you need to focus on the the key bit, the bit that's going to get you through, but also keeping in mind the bit that's going to get you ahead as well. So I thought, like, it was a really interesting blog post. Um, it wasn't one I'm not as familiar with the NFX guys until you kind of shared it with me. But really interesting and lots of very good takeaways there for a lot of the companies we're working with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's like you can read these things. And we've I, I've seen a lot where they just say, okay, what's the number one thing you can do? Ask your customers to pay you quicker, right? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> Well, duh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I changed my payment terms from 30 days to 10 days about two years ago, right? And it comes in quicker. So th this stuff is a little bit more helpful, but it's all very personal, right? You know, it, it's got to be applicable to you for for this to make sense and for this to actually provide some some value for you. But I, I got some good value out of, you know, it made me think about a few things I hadn't thought about in a while. Right. And just that reminder of, of just dropping that crap you just don't need as part of your day. Um, and, you know, if, if you think, well, if I do that now, it might come back to me in a year and it might be really helpful. You know what? We may not see another year. I mean, in our lives, we will, you know, fingers crossed, obviously. But in uh, in business, it's it's tough. It's it's tough. All right. So we made our way through all three. Really cool to to, to do that and to get your thoughts on it as well, Owen. Um, yeah, Absolutely. And anything else kind of out there in, in the news this week or anything happening that that you found particularly interesting? I mean, I could mention that I spent uh, Monday morning, I got up early to watch the back-to-back -back episodes of The Last Dance on Netflix. <laughs> tell, tell me you've seen this. No. This is, the, this is the documentary of the 1997-98 Chicago Bulls team that was filmed like at the time by oh, ESPN. Oh, yeah. It I is, saw the oh, preview. It is incredible. I cannot tell you enough. Like that's how I, I went out of my preview. way to get up early because it only gets released in Netflix on the Sunday night, like at 12 o'clock or whatever. So I got up. It is brilliant. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. The I, best one I've seen. I saw, when I saw Michael Jordan give his eulogy to Kobe Bryant. At Kobe, yeah, yeah, that was excellent. Um, and then I saw the preview on Netflix for Last Dance and saw Michael there. I'm like, I got to watch that. But that's one of those things, you're right, that with, um, what is it, eight kids between the two of us, um, <laughs> that, that that's something that you either got to watch early in the morning or late at night. Uh, oh yeah, so. I needed un undivided attention. That's what you want. Because they release uh, it in double, there's only 10 episodes, so every Sunday they release or every Monday morning they release them in batches of two so like you have a two hour block there I was like I'm getting up to watch this with no noise was like, it was excellent all right I might do that tomorrow morning well, I've been getting yeah. eight hours of sleep a night for some reason now over the last few weeks so um I may keep that going but uh no I'll, I could get it in late late Friday or Saturday but anyway yeah. no yeah. thanks for that I'll definitely dig in <laughs> <laughs> all right so okay. we'll uh you know, I'd like to say talk next week, but we'll probably talk tomorrow, right? Probably, yeah. All right. All right. Thanks, Owen. Talk to you. Money never sleeps, pal. That wraps it up, folks. Thanks to listening to us try to figure out why the world does what it does. Links for the stories we covered are in the show notes for this episode on moneyneversleeps.ie, so check us out online. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for editing this podcast. As for me, I increase the odds of startup success. DM me on Twitter at ptownsnv if you want to know more. You can follow Owen on 
Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald 9. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya.